So, hello again, everybody, and I'm very glad that you're joining us tonight. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Robert Terstieg. I've been working at Parkinson Society Central and Northern Ontario in our client services department with Sandy Jones uh, for four years in January. Uh, I've also been working and volunteering frontline in the medical social sector right now for 20 years. Um, and that doesn't necessarily make me an expert in either the progression of Parkinson's nor in palliative issues. What these things do make me as somebody who's very willing to talk about things openly and hopefully address some of the concerns that I know some of you are currently experiencing. And I'm willing to bet all of you have experienced at least once. So It's very common for a lot of folks uh, to cope with either there we go. It's very common for a lot of folks to cope with either getting a diagnosis or a change in symptoms by being in denial or just ignoring the possibilities that the future might hold. Our emphasis is that we speak of time and time again is living well with Parkinson's and this really does continue to be our message this evening as well. The information that we're going to be discussing tonight will hopefully be just another tool in your toolkit. Just like a driver keeps a spare tire, not because you hope to get a flat, but because you don't want to get caught without a spare if you do get a flat. We want to give you information tonight, not because this is going to happen to you, but in case something happens, you have a chance to be prepared. And one of the biggest questions that we receive from multiple people prior to this webinar is, are you going to be talking about death? Yes, briefly, we will be talking about death though we're going to be focused on life. So before I start, I just want to mention a very old adage that for some reason a lot of people seem to, to forget. Benjamin Franklin's famous phrase, in this world nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. So regardless of whether you are someone who's been diagnosed with Parkinson's or whether you're a family member, a friend, or a healthcare professional, the truth is, I can guarantee with about 99.99% accuracy that at some point, we're all going to die. It's the how and the when that neither doctors nor I can answer. And for myself, in the immortal words of Woody Allen, I'm not afraid of death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. So this summer, you may be aware of the fact that uh, the Canadian guidelines on Parkinson's disease were published in the Canadian Journal of Neurological Sciences and endorsed by the Canadian Neurological Sciences Federation. And these are the first consensus guidelines about Parkinson's and include recommendations from everything from diagnosis to palliative issues and they are geared towards multidisciplinary health professionals. There are two points that I'd like to sort of highlight uh, that are just in this little introduction that are on the side there. One, that the guidelines take into account patient choice and informed decision making. And two, that the appropriate healthcare professional is making the decision on each individual patient. But in order for you to make an informed decision based on the symptoms and, and the signs that your healthcare team is making a judgment on, you need to have some idea of what you're dealing with. As we continue to say throughout your entire journey with Parkinson's, you want the most knowledgeable specialist you can get looking at your treatment. But you also have to understand the options that they're providing for you and to you. So let's take a minute, go back and sort of review what we do know about Parkinson's. Trap. Probably if you've ever been through an education session with myself or with Sandy Jones at, at Parkinson's Society or John, you've, you've, you've seen TRAP before. And these are the cardinal motor signs of, of Parkinson's. So again, T is for tremor. And in the early stages of Parkinson's, tremor is what we call a resting tremor. And it's often more constant in advanced stages if it's not adequately, adequately medicated. But at any stage of Parkinson's, tremor is one of the hardest symptoms for, for a doctor to try to control. R is for rigidity or stiffness. And it's a symptom that responds very well to the medications that we have. A is for akinesia 
or bradykinesia, and all that means is slowness of movement. And again, that's another symptom that, that is uh, easily uh, corrected with medication or, or taken care of with medication. So diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is based on a doctor seeing two out of those first three symptoms. And the reason for that is that the P postural changes don't normally appear until later on with Parkinson's disease. So that could be issues with balance, that could be issues with, with uh, walking as well. And balance is not improved by drug therapy. Other postural problems is, is having a forward-leaning posture or gait difficulties, walking difficulties, uh, such as what's called festination of, of steps, which are short, rapid steps, as well as freezing that can cause frequent falls when there's balance issues. So, Falls are not preventable in advanced Parkinson's. Earlier on in Parkinson's, going to a falls clinic is hugely helpful, just as, as physio early on is going to be hugely helpful for the long course and the long duration of, of having this condition. Why falls become a major concern to us is that the older a person is, and because of osteoporosis, there is a concern that somebody could break a hip and be hospitalized. So one thing I do want to mention, it is definitely worth noting that being assessed for having a walker or a wheelchair or a scooter at the right point in life can mean that somebody can continue to enjoy life without the fear of injury. Some people are very reluctant to getting a mobility aid of some kind. So just wanted to make note of that as well. And I got ahead of myself, but I, again, I meant to uh, mention the fact that it's the first uh, uh, seeing two out of the first three symptoms. So those are the motor symptoms. So with the progression of Parkinson's, it's a chronic progressive condition. It can gradually get more difficult to manage over time, and we do not at this point have any way to slow the progression or stop what's happening in the brain. There can be varying symptoms that people have and different levels of disability. In the early stages, it's very, very difficult for even the best specialists in the world to try to predict where someone is going to be in 5, 10, or 20 years. What's key to note is some people never reach advanced stages of Parkinson's. So again, this is one of the reasons that I, I want to uh, emphasize you know, that this is not what we're talking about tonight, not necessarily going to happen to you, so I don't want you to be scared of, of what we're talking about tonight. We do know that someone who takes a positive attitude, takes their medication properly, and starts exercising earlier on in their diagnosis is going to do better in the long run than someone who does not practice good self-care. So that's again one of those things that we continually talk about as living well with Parkinson's and what you need to do for keeping well yourself. A very common question is, is Parkinson's going going to kill me. Statistically speaking, life expectancy is only a little bit shorter by a year or two or so than people without Parkinson's disease. People do not die from Parkinson's disease itself and we are going to get into that. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about medication and this particular slide provides an example of how levodopa can cause motor complications. These curves, those are the ons and the offs that, that you're probably aware of. Um, it's the fluctuations that people have during the day. You take a pill, um, the medication kicks in, it wears off, you take another pill, and so on throughout the day. That yellow area is what we call the range of, of the therapeutic range, or it's, it's how much levodopa is actually in your body that's needed con to control Parkinson's symptoms. So early on in the disease, there is enough dopamine being made by the neurons to compensate for times when levodopa levels from medication are, are reduced at the end or at the beginning of the dosing period when you're taking your medication. But as neurons over the course of the disease produce less dopamine, fluctuations in levodopa concentrations in the blood are going to result in more motor complications. 
So in this top diagram that you see on your screen right now, the concentration of levodopa remains within the therapeutic range to treat symptoms. But in my next diagram here, you'll notice that that yellow range is more narrowed. So at the top, above that yellow line, that's when dyskinesia is going to happen, that there's too much medication in the system. And at the bottom loop, you're going to notice that's when people are more off with their medications, that they're not experiencing as good of a benefit as they once did. That's not to say that the medication isn't working altogether. It's just a smaller window of opportunity where it's working properly for that person to get the, the maximum benefit for their medications throughout the day. So everyone continues to receive benefit from levodopa. It's a smaller window of opportunity as the disease progresses. And there's two concerns for both having dyskinesias and being off. Because during those two times, it puts the uh, person living with Parkinson's at risk of falling, at risk of injury, and risk of choking. So that's what we need to be concerned about with that on how well the medications are working. Now I know some of you may have questions about how do you know what stage of Parkinson's you're in and what's going to happen next. And I'm going to very, very quickly touch on the stages and then tell you why, unless you're a doctor, it's fairly useless information. It's not like staging of cancer. People are very familiar with the concept of he's at stage two with cancer. There's, there's different concerns. It's not quite the same with, with Parkinson's. The progression of Parkinson's is highly variable from one person to another person. So the staging of the disease is done by looking at your particular symptoms rather than the number of years you have had with Parkinson's. So what I'm going to show you here is what's called the Hone and Yar scale, which is useful to a doctor for outlining the stages of Parkinson's for clinical purposes. So very quickly, for stage one, Stage 1 basically means some symptom has shown up on one side of your body. Stage 2 means that symptoms are on both sides of your body. Stage 3 means that there's a little bit of postural instability. So it's people are having a little bit of problems with walking or a little bit of problems with balance. At stage 4, there may be a lot of symptoms, but people can still stand and walk unassisted. Stage five means that somebody is pretty much confined to either a wheelchair or to bed. The biggest problem with these stages and getting staged is that it depends on what exactly is happening with you that day. Did you take your medication on time? Are you just having a bad day? Somebody with Parkinson's can sort of fluctuate between these different stages within the course of one day. So usually specialists use what's called uh, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, or UPDRS, for evaluating patients in order to get a more clear idea of what is going on from one visit to the next. That's why it's very important when you're seeing your specialist that you need to be telling them exactly what is going on. And when they say, how are you doing today? Don't just say, fine because then they don't know what's going on and they're not going to be able to adjust your medications to help you as best. So the progression of Parkinson's over time, what does it really look like? We know there's no cure. The medications are there to offset symptoms. So what is happening? So in the beginning, somebody's going along, they get diagnosed, they go to see their doctor, they start taking their medication, they continue on for a period. The right balance of medication happens until they experience a change in, in symptoms. Go back to the doctor. Medications get changed. They continue on and they can be continuing on for, for years. I'm obviously shortening this up quite a bit. There can be worsening symptoms. Go back to the doctor. But then the doctor is going to have more limited medication options, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Advanced symptoms can appear, and a person may deteriorate. Again, not everybody is going to get to advanced stages of Parkinson's disease. 
So let's talk about some of the treatment in later stages. It's a balancing act, which is why I've got the scale going here. The doctor always has to look between symptoms and side effects, risks and benefits for medications. Every medication on the market, from, from cough syrup over the counter to what you're getting with Parkinson's, everything has a risk and everything has a benefit and the potential for, for relieving your symptoms or giving you a side effect. So you're probably wondering, if Parkinson's is just a result of lack of dopamine, why doesn't the doctor just give you more levodopa? So while Parkinson's medications aren't toxic, they can have those potential side effects. There is the possibility of incre increased dyskinesia, and dyskinesia means uncontrolled movement. There's also a risk of triggering certain psychiatric symptoms, such as hallucinations and those can present their own challenges to deal with. So the doctor tries to avoid setting you up for getting more symptoms that you don't need. People we hear from also wonder why the doctor has not suggested deep brain stimulation or DBS surgery. DBS surgery is not an option in late stage Parkinson's. DBS surgery is normally done for someone who is a young onset person but has exhausted all their medication combinations yet still experiences some benefit from their medication. Aside from having Parkinson's, they must be healthy in all other areas, which is why surgical options are rarely considered for someone over the age of 70. Because it's a fact of life, as we age, there's chances that we're going to have more health conditions. So we want to avoid those kinds of complications. Things like physio and rehabilitation should always be tried, but options can be more limited in advanced Parkinson's. Consistent exercise through the early stages of Parkinson's are going to be of much more benefit to you in the long term. I want you to think about it this way. If you were going to start training for a marathon, when are you going to do it? You're not going to start a week before the marathon. So if you're already having severe walking problems, that's, you're not going to get as much benefit from starting a physio program as someone who's initially diagnosed starts exercise and maintains exercise throughout the course of having their disease. That's a big reason that we, we encourage folks to start and maintain exercise. Still, physio and range of motion exercises at later stages can definitely help to alleviate the stiffness and associated pain from stiffness. So because I can't see you right now, I'm going to pause here for a moment and let everyone take a breath. I'm sure a few of you out there are trying to self-diagnose yourself or your loved one, and you're trying to determine where things are for you right now, and I don't want you to do that. Please don't do that. What I want to do as well right now, I want to introduce or reacquaint you with an idea, and that's the idea of having a good death. If this seems strange, I want you to consider this. From the time you're small, we think about what are you going to do when you grow up? You're thinking about getting a job, maybe getting married, having 1.5 children, getting a cat, a dog, the white picket fence, grandchildren, and happily ever after. And that's as usually as far as we think when we think about our future. If we are all together in one room right now where I could see you, I would ask for a show of hands for the next few questions. But right now, I'm just, I'm just going to ask the questions and get you to think about them. How many of you have been married? How many of you have been to a wedding? How many of you have been to a graduation ceremony? How many of you have been to a funeral? How many of you have been in the same room as someone dying? And how many of you have been the executor of an estate? There's a reason I ask these questions. Not all of us will marry, but most adults have been to at least one wedding ceremony in their life. Not everyone is going to graduate, but most of us are familiar with a graduate, what a graduation ceremony is and what it all entails. And, and if you have grandkids, uh, or kids probably to spend on, on getting a present or two for, for their efforts there. So we're familiar with all those. Yet not everyone has been to a funeral. And not everyone has had someone close to them die. 
Most people have never been present when another person has died or seen a body outside of a funeral home. And most of us will never ever be an executor of an estate. Now think about that for a minute. All of us at one point will die. Yet many of us are unfamiliar with death and the rituals associated with it. We don't even like to talk, use the word death. We use colloquial terms. God's called her back. He's finally at peace. She's passed on. He's with the angels. Because of this mystique, we have a fear, not only about death, but talking about death. So that, that is my lead up, because we're going to talk about death for a minute. Going back to the Canadian Consensus Guideline recommendations, there are two recommendations when it comes to palliative issues. The first one is palliative care requirements of people with Parkinson's disease should be required throughout all phases of the disease. Basically put, when you are confronted, when you are diagnosed with a chronic health care condition, you are given an opportunity to put some plans into place. If you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, you have a chronic progressive condition. Your symptoms will increase. And the idea is to plan for the worst and hope for the best. Just like everything else in, in life, you want to plan for the worst, hope for the best, and, and life in general usually falls somewhere in between those two ideals. The second point from the guidelines is that people with Parkinson's disease and their caregivers should be given the opportunity to discuss end-of-life issues with appropriate healthcare professionals. Well, guess what? Doctors don't always like to talk about the possibility of dying with patients or what's going to happen if someone's ill. Most doctors do not deal well with giving bad news, unfortunately, and they tend to view death as a disease that they cannot treat. They may not be willing to start the conversation, so if you don't ask, or if you don't ask for a clarification of what they're talking about, you won't know necessarily what's going on, and you won't have the information to make informed choices. That said, let's take Parkinson's out of the equation for a moment. Have any of you considered how you are most likely to die? The following comes from um, Stats Canada. So, for the three age groups of 45 to 64, 65 to 79, and 80%. For the first two groups, cancer. For, the, uh, for 80 plus, 38% circulatory disease. And by circulatory disease, we're talking about stroke, we're talking about heart disease. So you can see those comparisons. The, the other two for 65 to 80 plus respiratory conditions includes influenza and pneumonia. That's by and large, taking even Parkinson's out of the equation, what the future could possibly hold for people. Something we don't always think about. So, what about Parkinson's? Everyone's always asking why we say you die with Parkinson's and not from Parkinson's, and is that just semantics? The truth is, there is very little information about palliative stages, the end stages of Parkinson's disease, and even our guidelines say that. Parkinson's is not a reportable condition in general, which is why there is a certain lack of information in general about it alt altogether. What we do know is that there are two major areas of concern for risk of death for someone living with Parkinson's. And those two areas are a fall and resulting in mobility issues in case that there's, there's a broken hip. The other one is pneumonia due to aspiration. And aspiration is food or liquid going down the wrong tube and someone being unable to cough it out. In both cases, if a person is more elderly or weakened, they are unable to fight off infection. So some people who are immobilized because of a broken hip or confined to bed may experience a heart attack or stroke because of blood clot forms. So when we hear that the doctor put Parkinson's on the certificate or, or the doctor said it was Parkinson's that, that killed somebody, basically that comes down to when somebody dies, a doctor has to write an official cause of death. So some simply write down Parkinson's to 
expedite forms. Some may write down pneumonia, some may write down stroke, depending on what the actual cause of death is. Again, when we take Parkinson's out of the equation, remember that, that other slide that I just showed you, it's the same risks whether you had Parkinson's or not. If somebody is elderly without Parkinson's falls, they're at a risk of a broken hip. If they're elderly, there's a chance that they can choke, getting pneumonia, influenza, aspiration, that can do with age more than Parkinson's as well. So now that I've said that, where do we go from here? Hopefully at this point, I haven't got you completely depressed and scared about the future. As I was told by one of the members of the Sudbury chapter, when we're dealing, talking about the dark side of Parkinson's, I loved her phrase, it's tricky to strike a balance between knowledge edifying and knowledge terrifying. So I want to educate you and I don't want to scare you. Again, I want to reinforce the idea that this is not something that will happen, but what may happen. You're probably wondering, what do you do with this information now? Well, really the same as anyone else planning for their future. The first thing that we tell anyone, and it's my personal opinion, anyone turning 18 must do these pieces of, of paper. Your, your, your wills, your powers of attorney, and hopefully an advanced directive, which is like a living will in case you cannot communicate with somebody. Once you've done that, you have to let people know. Does your spouse and do your children and does your power of attorney actually know what your preferences are? If you are suddenly unable to talk or communicate and are suddenly in the hospital, someone is going to have to make decisions on your behalf. And this can lead to all kinds of family distress. Keep in mind, your doctor can offer choices and your loved ones may want to err on the side of caution, if, especially if they don't know your choices. It's very important. Your decisions may also be based on your personal, cultural, religious beliefs. Please don't assume that your loved ones know what your choices are and what your beliefs are. For example, if someone has severe swallowing issues, what can be offered by the doctor is to have a feeding tube inserted. This does allow for somebody to continue to receive nutrition and medication, but does not stop the risk of choking. A person can still aspirate on their own saliva, thus still end up with pneumonia. So that's a very difficult decision. The doctor may say, here's, here's the choices that we have. So you need to know a little bit about this in order to, to be able to save yourself from suffering, from your family suffering, having to make a choice. Which way you go, there's, there's pros and cons on, on both sides of that. The other big thing is, have you done financial planning and what have you based this on? Is this on your current way of life or are you considering the needs that you might have in the future? So talking about some of those needs in the future. Many people are going to be fine and continue to live independently for years. But right now, I'm going to be the devil's advocate, which is why I've got my little devil happening here. I want you to think right now about some of the what-ifs. Only you and your family are going to have the answer to these questions that I'm going to ask for your own situation. And I'm not going to say one way is right, one way is not. That, that's not my job. I, my job is to give you information to help you make an informed decision. So I want you to think about your situation if it wasn't about you, but it was about your best friend. What advice would you give your best friend if they were living in your situation? And again, I want to emphasize, this is not all Parkinson's related. These are the same questions that I would ask any older adult who is planning to live a very long life. Where will you live? Where you live can mean a whole host of things. First off, if you have a progressive condition, is your current home suited for your needs right now and your needs in the future? What type of home do you live in right now? Do you live in a split level home? Do you live on a single level. For some people the simplest solution is to move from a house to a condo or an apartment. There's less for them to take care of, there's less hazards to worry about, it's easier to maintain, and it's safer altogether. 
So that's thinking about the style. The other thing, equipment. If you have any equipment needs, such as a walker, if you needed a wheelchair, if you needed to put in bath bars, would you be able to do that in your own home? A standard wheelchair actually needs about three feet turning distance to get into a door. Um, and, and that's just a standard basic wheelchair. Somebody might need a larger wheelchair depending on their particular needs. Are you going to be able to get it in and out? Are you going to be able to turn the corners in your house? These are things that you need to, to consider as well. Are you going to be able, from a financial perspective, to modify your house? Are you going to be able to do that from a physical stance? This can be anything from installing those grab bars, to ramps, to stair lifts, to widening doorways, to putting in a walk-in bathtub or a roll-in shower. If you rent, you might not be able to make certain modifications to your home. If you live in a house, it, it might cost a lot to do that. Uh, so those are some things that we do need to consider. Again, not just for Parkinson's, but for aging as well in general. The other big consideration is the location you move to. It's just as important as what you are living in, but it's where you're living. Many people, when they become empty nesters and decide to downsize from the family dwelling, again, regardless of having Parkinson's, they, they may end up making a move to a location that later on they regret. Moving to be closer to the children or moving to the cottage to get away from it all can, can be an a uncomfortable decision uh, for future health concerns. You have to think, are you going to be close to a community that you're comfortable with, with access to your family and friends, shopping, entertainment, place of worship? If you should be unable to drive, whether from Parkinson's or from other age-related conditions, are you going to have an alternative form of transportation to access your community? What kind of services are available in your new community? Many government services have been downloaded from the federal to the provincial to the municipal level, and they're not actually funded to ensure sustainability, so they might not exist. That means community-based agencies have tried to pick up the slack, and they have limited resources. So as a result, there's very, very strict rules for, for catchment areas and types of services. So for an example, in Toronto, there could be a lot more community-based services to choose from than out in Muskoka. That said, in Toronto, certain streets may be cut-off points. So if you live on the east side of the street, you are entitled to a service that your neighbor on the west side of the street is not entitled to. So location is important. Finally, where are your health specialists? Again, the older that somebody is, the more potential that there is to needing different health specialists, whether, again, it's Parkinson's specialist or not. Don't assume there are specialists in the area that you're moving to. And can you get a family doctor in the new area that you're moving to? All of these things need to be considered for your future. Who's going to take care of you? Because of Parkinson's, you do have a chance of disability up to and including being wheelchair or bed bound. Now, taking that as your worst case scenario, what are you doing to plan for your best care? If you are immobile, who is going to be taking care of you? If this is your spouse, is your spouse going to be physically able to take care of you? And I'm not talking about, you know, the fact that people do take the idea of in sickness and in health to be, to be very true and very real. However, caregivers can be at risk of hurting themselves and in trying to help somebody um, and help them with a the transfer. And it's not uncommon for the entire family to be placed into crisis because mom, who's the caregiver, broke her hip trying to stop dad, the person with Parkinson's, from falling. That means mom ends up in the hospital, so where does dad go? Well, does dad move in with the children? If you do have adult children, you have to consider, is their home going to be able to accommodate you and your needs as well? Physically, as well as can they get you to appointments? Are they in a financial uh, position to help here? So those are considerations. Well, some people also think, I pay my taxes, there's government services. Government-funded in-home services are provided in Ontario through what's called Community Care Access Centre, or CCAC.
currently, on average across Ontario, people are getting about four hours a week of in-home help if they qualify for it. In most cases, CCAC workers are not allowed to administer medication. They do not provide house cleaning, usually beyond cleaning the, the bathroom or kitchen. And they can't take somebody out of the home. So you think you're going to hire somebody. Well, private help through a personal support worker or a PSW agency can often be more flexible in the type of service provided. However, there still may be certain restrictions on what they can do. And in Ontario, the current average cost for getting a bonded PSW through a reputable agency is approximately $20 to $25 an hour. And that's whether you're in Toronto or whether you're in Thunder Bay right now. And there's usually about a three-hour minimum booking. So that's an expense that most people don't really figure on. So, in closing, I don't have a crystal ball and I can't tell you what the future is going to bring any one of you. We've taken a look at the darker side of Parkinson's, but at the same time, we've taken a look at things that every single adult without Parkinson's should be aware of and should be considering as well to plan for their future. What I do see now is that we do have some time for questions, and if you're not wanting to ask me now, you can always contact me at the office afterwards. So I will leave it to uh, John right now to sort of sort out where we're at here. That's great. Thank you, Robert. Um, I, I know that I found the presentation valuable, and I hope that uh, everyone else did as well. Uh, I'll be honest in that when we started planning for this presentation, I mentioned to Robert that I had some concerns about being sure that it was packaged the right way, particularly we were speaking to a faceless room and, and people uh, across the region, but uh, I think it came across very well. I think there is valuable information here and I hope that everyone found it valuable. Uh, Robert, I, I took no questions during the uh, during the session itself, um, but again, we'll open it up to those folks who have questions to enter them into the chat box now, uh, and I'll read those, relay those to you as they come. Uh, alternatively, as Robert mentioned, you can email him after the session, and those that wish to, to go now can leave the room as we're done the formal presentation, but we are hoping for some presentation, or some questions, pardon me. Uh, thanks, everyone.